we are now recording. Thank you, Hannah, and thank you, Jan. The Feast of the Visitation of the Virgin Mary was added to the Roman calendar at the end of the 14th century. A number of offices were composed before its official introduction, including Jan of Jenstein's Exergens Autum Maria and Adam Easton's Accedent Lages Virginis. In this paper, I will present some preliminary examinations of the reception of both offices in Europe, particularly in Germany and in West Slavic countries, modern day Czech Republic, Poland and Slovakia, using an analysis of the office's dissemination and modification and case studies to demonstrate two particularly revealing variations. In order to determine the reception of a repertory within a particular geographic or temporal area, a number of elements need to be considered, including the dissemination of the repertory, the speed at which this dissemination occurred, how long the repertory was used for, the extent to which the repertory was deliberately modified and the reasons for these modifications. First-hand accounts detailing the views of contemporary audiences would of course be fantastic. Unfortunately, these are not often available. In this case, Jenstein's office went through a rigorous review process within the papal curia. The extensive process of submission, criticism, revision and further criticism was well documented by Jenstein's assistant, Nicholas Sobrakovnik. These sources, um, I have got manuscript IF777 and manuscript VATLAT 1122, which provide such details, uh, give both positive and negative responses to the feast in general and Jenstein's office itself, um, but they do not give any information about Easton's office. And I have not found any later references to either office after the feast's official institution, and so we must turn to the manuscript evidence. I shall first look at the spread and speed of the dissemination of these two offices. I've identified at least 47 manuscripts and printed books which contain these two offices. 29 sources contain only Jenstein's office, 12 only Easton's, and six contain chants from both. From the manuscripts that I've identified thus far, Jenstein's office is found predominantly in sources from North Central and Eastern Europe. There is a clear cluster within modern day Czech Republic, Poland and Slovakia, which is likely due to the um, databases and um, catalogues that I was using. In terms of dating, many of the manuscripts are dated to the 14th and 15th centuries, suggesting that Jenstein's office spread quickly throughout the region. Jenstein celebrated the visitation within his own archdiocese in Prague, using this office in 1386, four years before the papal curia pr promulgated it. And when the visitation was celebrated for the first time in Rome in 1390, it was celebrated according to the, quote, Prague rubric, end quote, confirming that Exergens Auto Maria was the established office used within Prague at that time. I identified far fewer manuscripts which contain Easton's office, although spread further to the west of Europe. They also appear to be slightly later dated overall. The only manuscript dated definitively to the 14th century, number two here, um, is manuscript R626, a 1397 manuscript from Olomots in Moravia, the Czech Republic. This breviary contains both offices. Jenstein's is given in full in the main corpus, and then Easton's is added later at the end. These manuscripts and printed books, although a relatively small sample, demonstrate that although Easton's office was promulgated by a papal curia, Jenstein spread quickly throughout Europe. To look at the end date of the, um, the, the dissemination, marginalia on folio 357R in the youngest notated source for Jenstein, printed in 1537 in Germany, gives the location of the missing Compline antiphon, which is found much later in the manuscript in the feast of Mary's presentation at the temple. The inclusion of these instructions indicates that Jenstein's office was actively used to celebrate the visitation in Münster after 1537. I have also found the text of Jenstein's office in later text-only breviaries, including the 1771 breviary for the Order of the Cistercians. The latest I have found Easton's office is in two 16th century manuscripts from Braga in Portugal. I should note that there are definitely many more manuscripts which include these two offices. 
Um, I worked from online indexes, databases, archives, digital collections and physical libraries available to me. And it's very lucky for me that collections within Central Europe are particularly well catalogued and digitized. The lack of source data from countries such as France and Italy does not therefore mean the offices weren't used, only that I didn't find the sources. I just wanted to make that clear. I turn now to a discussion of the modification of two offices. Many sources which contain Jenstein's office show remarkable conformity to the office transmitted in the earliest sources from Bohemia. Many of the variants are small, one word different, short musical variation or a difference in melody text alignment and often appear to be scribal errors rather than deliberate modifications. Where the content differs between a manuscript and the earliest source, this is often explained by a reordering of the responsories in Vespers and Matins. The 15th century manuscript 12A21 from Colin in the Czech Republic, for example, uses the same three responsories as the earlier manuscript, but with a slightly different order and without a fourth responsory in the third nocturne of Matins. There are, of course, some manuscripts which transmit a highly modified version of the office, and I've identified two such forms of Jenstein's. The first appears in the three Compré manuscripts, which are 28, 29, 30, from the 15th and 16th centuries. And the second, which will be used as a case study in this paper, is an adaptation for monastic use found in two Benedictine manuscripts from Zweifolter, number 25 here, and Ahas, number 27 here. There is far more deliberate textual and melodic variation between different instances of Easton's office than Jenstein's, both in terms of short or even fairly long melodic variations, but also in the creation of completely alternative melodies, which I didn't find for Jenstein. Within the sources I examined, there are three modified versions of the office, a Moravian variant, which I shall use as a case study, numbers two and 12, um, a Portuguese variant found in the two 16th century manuscripts from Braga here, um, and a version unique to the 15th century German manuscript 13A7, which is number four here. The first case study I will present is an adaptation of Jenstein's office for monastic use found in two manuscripts from the Benedictine monasteries in Zweifolten and Achas. Jenstein's nine lesson office follows a secular format and so includes three antiphons and three responsories in each nocturne, although he does give a fourth possible, which you can swap out um, for the last responsory of Matins. The two Benedictine manuscripts follow the monastic three nocturne Matins form described by John Harper, where the first two nocturnes contain six antiphons and four responsories, and the third nocturne includes only one antiphon and four responsories. The chants within the Matins Nocturnes in these two manuscripts are compared to my principal source on the slide. Chants found in the original position are just noted as same. Chants which are taken from elsewhere in Jenstein's office are identified and their original location is noted. And chants which are not included in Jenstein's office are given in bold. Most of the differences between Jenstein's office and the version found in these two manuscripts are explained by items moving between Matins um, between nocturnes and matins, sorry, and chants from Vespers and Compline being repeated. Out of the newly added chants, three, Hekest Queneskivit, the Antiphon Vox de Tordis Audita, and Beata Medicent Omnes are common to other Marian feasts, most notably the Assumption and the Annunciation. Three chants, Misericordia et Veritas, Redemptoris Mata Piaspes, and Gaudi Maria Virgo Cunctas appear to be unique to these manuscripts. The final chant in bold, the responsory Vox Tutoris Audita, is a bit more complicated. On Cantus Index, this chant is only found in three 15th century manuscripts from Germany and Bohemia, but always within Jenstein's visitation office. However, I initially did not consider it to be one of Jenstein's chants, as it is not given within the office in the earliest manuscripts written, including that, that 1122, a manuscript which contains the full office, including readings and prayers, as well as marginalia uh, written by Jenstein himself, indicating that the archbishop had a level of control over the contents. And it's also not found in the other 26 manuscripts that I looked at. On further examination of the earliest source from Bohemia, however, I did eventually find Vox Tutoris Audita, 
much later in the manuscript and outside of the office for the visitation. It might therefore be one of Jenstein's chants or an early addition to the office in this manuscript. However, it does link these two Benedictine manuscripts to the earliest source containing Jenstein's office. While they have not adapted Exergen's Alta Maria in exactly the same way, the similar nature of the Matins editions in these two geographically distant manuscripts suggests a level of coordination, possibly an established method for transforming secular offices for monastic use, which would be very interesting to look into. An examination of visitation offices in other Benedictine manuscripts may also show whether Jenstein's office was in common use or whether there is a closer link between these two monasteries and the earliest Jenstein sources. The second case study I will present in this paper is a Moravian variant of Easton's office, found in manuscripts R626 and M46, both with an Olomot's provenance. The melodies of all except two of Easton's chants are contrafact, modified from the melodies of Julian of Speyer's office for St. Francis of Assisi, Franciscus Vier Catholicus. Some of Easton's melodies are highly modified to account for additional or fewer textual lines, an altered meter, or even for apparent aesthetic purposes. What is particularly interesting about these two sources is the number of chants for which the melody more closely follows Speyer's original tune rather than Easton's modifications. Um, on the slide, the table shows Easton's hymns in the left column, the position within the office, not the hymn, sorry, Easton's chants in the left common, column, the position within the office and the incipit, and then the source of the melody in the two Moravian vari variants um, in the middle and right column. In each of these chants, Easton's melody was so highly modified that on an initial look, these manuscripts do not appear to use the same tune, but when you look closely at the Speyer original, you see that they are actually going back to, to Speyer's. Unfortunately, neither office is complete, as both manuscripts have a number of folios missing. However, the manuscripts occur to such a high degree in the 28 chants they do include together, that I believe the chants on the missing folios would have been quite similar. The melody used for Easton's Vespers hymn in Maria Vitam Viam is particularly re revealing. In Easton's office, this text is one of only two that are set to newly composed melodies. Manuscript M46 is unfortunately missing this folio, but the text in manuscript R626 is definitely not set to Easton's melody, as shown in the transcription on the right of the slide, where Easton's is given on the top line and this manuscript is given on the bottom line. A comparison with other commonly given Speyer hymn melodies showed no similarities, but there was one hymn that was only rarely given in manuscripts, and when it was, usually only as a text in Chipit, Proles de Celo Prodit. I finally found one notated in Chipit in a mid 14th century Franciscan antiphona from Central Europe, manuscript one in Barnard College Library, Columbia University. Although I only have the in Chipit to compare, they are similar enough that I suggest that in manuscript R626, Easton's text has been set to the Speyer melody for Proles de Celo Prodit. The responsory Stella Sub Nube shows an example of where Easton's text differed in structure from Speyer's original. Throughout his office, Easton deliberately retained melodic divisions between the first and second parts of a respond. However, he did not usually follow the same textual division as Speyer. Responds are split into two halves, and in this particular example, Speyer's Audit in Evangelio was written with two lines in the first half and then four lines in the second half. Easton's text was composed in equal lines of three and three. This difference in textual structure necessitated extensive changes to ensure that the melodic divisions were kept, with phrases removed from the first half to avoid an unusually melismatic section and new phrases added to the second half to make up for the lack of source material. Keeping this musical division between the two halves of the respond also retains the original melodic links between the end of the verse or the doxology and the beginning of the repeated second half of the respond. In Stella sub nube, the verse and doxology both end on an F, which would then be followed by a rising notes AC at the beginning of Elizabeth here on like the fourth line, to create the FAC triad typical of F authentic chants. Comparison between Easton's modified melody on the first line 
Speyer's original on the second and the two Moravian manuscripts on the third and fourth reveals the extent to which the Moravian manuscripts followed Speyer's malady rather than Easton's. Miriam Wendling has suggested the Easton's office may have been transmitted in a purely text format in some cases, leaving scribes to set the text to the indicated Speyer maladies. In many of the manuscripts I examined, this does not appear to be the case, as particular modifications made by Easton to Speyer's maladies have been included. However, in this manuscript, the return to original Speyer maladies could indicate that they were not transmitted alongside the text. After a rather whirlwind tour of these two offices, I returned to my initial five elements of repertory reception. Jenstein's office was clearly popular throughout Northern and Central Eastern Europe. Although manuscripts containing Eastern's offices have more widespread provenances, I have far fewer examples, or at least his manuscripts are further to the, the West. Jenstein's office appears to have spread rapidly with many manuscripts dating to the 14th or early 15th centuries, while the first manuscripts containing Easton's office date from the 15th century. The popular and quick adoption of Jenstein's office within West Slavic countries likely reflects the recognition of Jenstein himself within that area, as well as his early promotion of the feast using his office within his archdiocese four years before it was added to the Roman calendar. It is therefore likely that in regions close to Prague, Celebration of the visitation using Jenstein's office was common before Easton's accident Lagis Virginis reached them. This is evidenced by the manuscripts which include both offices, with Jenstein's enjoying a prominent position within the main corpus, and Easton sort of tacked on the end. Although both repertories appear to have been in active use until at least the 16th century, I have so far only found Jenstein's as late as the 18th century. The fact that Exergens Altimoria was used alongside the official office for so long suggests that despite the criticism raised against it in the Papal Curia, the chants were popular, possibly even more popular than Easton's. There is also a pronounced difference in the amount of modification to Jenstein's and Easton's offices. There is often very little modification in chants from Exergens Altimoria, while Easton's chants were subjected to widespread, deliberate and extensive modification. Sorry. In this paper, I have presented two very specific large-scale modifications, for which I have suggested reasons. For Jenstein, the adaption to a monastic environment, and for Easton, possibly due to a text-only transmission. However, if we ignore these large-scale outliers, in general, Easton's chants were subjected to far more variations than Jenstein's. One possibility is that the scribes of some manuscripts may have made a conscious decision to include Jenstein's office as opposed to the official one, and therefore remained relatively true to the source material. Scribes of manuscripts with Easton's office may have used Accedent Laugus Virginis as it was the official version, but felt comfortable adapting the melodies to their needs and preferences. There may also have been some scribes who felt that Easton's melodies were almost familiar, they're so close to Speyer's, and so modified them to be closer to the version that Speyer, of Speyer that they were used to. What I have presented today is a preliminary, my preliminary research into this topic and future research aided by the discovery and digitization cataloging of further manuscripts will no doubt add to the understanding of the dissemination of these two offices and discover additional interesting variants. It would also be interesting to examine the dissemination of other contemporary visitation offices. Eight were submitted to the Papal Curia and additional offices were composed later, although none appear to have been as popular as either Jenstein's or Easton's. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rianne, and especially for the, for the perspective of how the devotion of this feast developed later in, in the 15th and 16th centuries. So are there any really burning comments and questions from the audience that we should clarify before we move to the next paper? Any... Yes, Christine. I have a, a question about um, dissemination, the, the movement. 
uh, how can you see your map with monastic and secular institutions? Were there mean, some patterns in the beginning or? Do you mean which ones are monastic and which ones are secular? Yes, in the timeline starts, does it start with more secular and then going to? Yes, I, I don't have a map to show you, I'm afraid, but I don't have that many from monastic um, environments and most of the very early ones are secular. Okay, that yes. has my question. Thank you very much. So, thank you again, Rianid. And uh, let's stay with, uh, with the visitation office. Um, moving to the next paper, which will, will be delivered by Dr. Juliet Calverin. It will be an art history paper um, focusing on uh, focusing on uh, the of, of Marian Chasubles for priestly bodies in Priusite Prague, which was also Juliet Calverin's uh, PhD topic. Uh, Juliet uh, studied um, studied her PhD in art history and Harvard University. And she also re recently gained her PhD in this year. And uh, she will deliver the paper called Respexit Humilitatem, the Madonna of Humility and the Feast of the Visitation around 1400. Uh, Juliet, do we have you here? Okay, yes, perfect. So I let you the floor. Hello, and thank you very much. Um, I'm especially glad to be allowed to be an interloper in this musicology session. <laughs> I'm very interested in sort of how the piece of the visitation had influence um, in the field of visual arts. So that's what I'm going to be talking about now. And let's see if I... Yep, it's not working. Um, that. Um, um, this, this worked so well before and now of course it's no longer working. Um, I can see your, your PowerPoint quite well. Well, yes. That's, I suppose I'll just do it this way without um, actually turning it onto a slideshow mode. Sorry about that. Um, it seems to not be letting me do that. So, um, with that, here we go. Um, in, I will start with the sort of end of my narrative. In 1423, a new altarpiece was installed um, in the Cathedral of Siena on an also new altar of the visitation located uh, in the transept facing the patronal altars in the crossing. This new altarpiece had a highly unusual iconography. It showed the Virgin Mary seated on the ground, nursing the Christ child. Um, but she rests atop three cherubim whose heads can be seen peeking out from below her cloak. Um, this particular iconography, the Madonna of Humility raised by angels, is shared by um, a chasuble, which is about 40 years earlier, um, made probably in Prague in the 1380s uh, for the convent of Augustinian canons in Rokitseni in Western Bohemia. And here is the chasuble in all of its Baroque glory. Um, these two works of art uh, have a common idea, despite being uh, many leagues apart and many years apart in their conception. I believe that the idea is a direct uh, response to the new Feast of the Visitation. And so in order to make that argument, I will first try to talk about how um, this iconography could be related to the Visitation, uh, sort of using both general medieval theology as well as Jenstein's own specific writings. We've heard about Jenstein um, plenty already, thankfully. And then I'll talk a little bit about the social context of both objects and how that um, could impact the reception of the piece of the visitation. 
So first, the Madonna of Humility and the Magnificat. Um, the Madonna of Humility is an image type that appeared in the middle of the 14th century um, in uh, the workshop of the Sienese painter Simone Martini. And it was known by that name. So some of the earliest panels, including the one on the left from Palermo, uh, have the inscription Nostra Domina de Humilitate. We also know that this title was known in Prague. Um, the Visegrad Madonna is not inscribed, but there was a hospital dedicated to Nostra Domina de Humilitate by the 1370s at the foot of the Visegrad, which was sponsored by Einstein's uncle, Jan Oczko of Russian. The feast too was related to the humility. Jenstein, as he promulgated it, argued that it was a feast of the Virgin's humility, both because the Virgin visiting her cousin Elizabeth was displaying her humility. Elizabeth is her inferior in a number of ways, according to Jenstein, but also because during the visitation, the Virgin sang um, her canticle, the Magnificat, and the Magnificat is the biblical source ascribing humility to the Virgin explicitly. And we also find the Magnificat inscribed in early, sort of pre-1386 panels of the Madonna of Humility, including this one in Florence. At the bottom, sort of on the ledge, you can see his big sit humilitatem and kile sue. So he witnessed the humility of his servant. Um, this would mean that the Madonna of Humility would already be a fairly adaptable iconography for the Feast of the Visitation. However, the Magnificat was as all of you musicologists know, most often sung sort of on its own as part of the Vespers and typically not considered within its narrative context of the visitation. When theologians wrote about the Magnificat, they tended to write about it as a response to the Annunciation, not so much in relation to the visitation. And so we can imagine that the, this Madonna of Humility iconography prior to the new feast was principally understood as relating to the Annunciation or relating to the Virgin Mary in a more general way. Um, but the new feast, of course, changed all that um, by refocusing attention on the narrative context of the Magnificat and all of the offices, um, both Easton's and Jenstein's and Raymond of Capua's, um, which I'll talk about a little bit, served to place the Magnificat back within its narrative context. Um, the new feast was also understood as a feast of the Magnificat. This is part of how Jenstein presented it. He tended to see the Magnificat as a sort of a new song, a canticle novum that would lead the church through the Great Schism, which the feast was in part designed to heal. He also understood the Magnificat as a sermon for the overproud clergy who had caused the schism in the first place. Um, and he tended to see the Magnificat as a prophecy for the new feast. So the line after his Pixit Humilitatem is um, Ecce et hoc beata medicant omnes generationes, all generations will come blessed. And Jenstein understood this as a prophecy for the new feast. So this would have made the Madonna of Humility doubly applicable to the Feast of the Visitation. We can see that in both of these examples, the image of the Madonna of Humility has undergone some modification to make it more suitable. Um, both of these images feature a lot of light. So in the Sienese painting, this is done through the use of chrysography, a technique which had fallen out of fashion a hundred years previously. Um, and in the Rokitsani Chasebo, we can sort of see that her mandorla um, has a very different gold couching pattern, sort of done in these little spirals of gold, which in a candlelit space would have been a very lively, very sort of light-filled um, field in contrast to the rest of the chasuble. Both of these, of course, feature the angels who raise up the Virgin, um, a visualization of another line in the Magnificat, exaltavit humines, so he has exalted the humble. Each of the two works also featured additional framing linking the image to the sort of situation de session, to the narrative context of the Magnificat. Um, in the Rokitsani Chasuble, this is the bottom field, which shows the incarnation, and then shows Christ not coming from outside, but born within Mary's womb, which is a more theologically correct position. Um, but it also shows the Virgin sort of looking down at what's happening. It sort of happens in between her hands. She's very much cognizant of the mystery of the incarnation. And her cognition of the mystery of the incarnation is what is then expressed within the Magnificat 
um, if it's understood as a sort of theological sermon, which Jenstein understood it to be. Um, in the Sionese altarpiece, it's a little bit less obvious, but it's also there. So there would have been an enunciation in the two central pinnacles, which are now missing. Um, they're now in private collections. And this enunciation was highlighted by the presence of the saint in the rightmost pinnacle, Saint Ansanus, one of the Sionese city patrons. Um, saint Ansanus was the saint on whose patronal altar the very famous enunciation by Simone Martini was done. And this patronal altar was, as I mentioned earlier, diagonally opposite the new visitation altar in the Sienese Duomo. So the Saint Ansanus figure in the Sienese painting sort of reflects the Annunciation altar almost like a mirror, sort of creating a narrative and spatial connection between the two events. Um, additionally, below Saint Ansanus is Saint Luke, alone of the four evangelists in the Gables. He is not looking down at his book, but looking at the central scene, sort of taking down notes. Of course, it is in St. Luke's Gospel that we find the text of the Magnificat. And lastly, the figure of John the Baptist, uh, pointing to the Christ child in the center, is a reminder that it was during the visitation that the unborn Baptist first encountered Christ and his divinity. Both of these works of art, therefore, sort of put together a number of strategies to center the idea of the Magnificat as a prophetic song, um, within the sort of new and somewhat innovative iconography. There is another reason, uh, one that's more specific to Jenstein, why this iconography would have come into play here. Um, and this is Jenstein's vision of 1378, at the very beginning of the schism. So Jenstein, who is not yet archbishop, had a vision in which a sort of very, very evil figure gave the keys of St. Peter to an interloper, um, and this prefigured the schism, which was about to happen. Everybody knew it was about to happen, so not much of a prophecy, but there we go. And at the very end of this prophecy, Jenstein sees a sort of consoling vision. And this is the Virgin Mary in a most beautiful meadow, dressed in this beautiful sky blue color, sitting down with her child. Of course, the idea of the Virgin Mary sitting in a meadow is the Madonna of Humility idea. Uh, Jenstein, we know, ordered uh, several depictions of this vision in mural paintings, sort of in Prague and in Rovnice and elsewhere, those are lost. Um, but it might be related to the growth of the sort of Paradiska line image type um, around the same time, around 1400. This is an early example, although still a little bit late for our purposes, um, from around 1410 now in Innsbruck. We can see how the same description also applies to the Bishop of Madonna itself and sort of without the flowery meadow to the Rokhita and Chasuble. So you can sort of draw a line um, between these different images in a way that celebrates sort of both this ecclesiastical background of the schism, as well as the content of the Magnificat understood as the content of the new feast. So I think that in both specific and less specific ways, does this new iconography reflects uh, Jens Jane's feast. That brings us to the question of context. Um, I'll try to be brief. Context is much easier to discuss in the case of Rokitsani. Rokitsani was um, a daughter house of Rodnice. So here Rokitsani is in red and Rodnice is in blue. These houses of Augustinian canons that have been founded by Jan of Dražic, the last bishop of Prague, were very, very close to the archbishops and they were especially close to Jenstein. We know that Jenstein stayed at Rodnice very often um, and his Obituary is also particularly effective in its tone, very unusually for the necrology of Rodentia, which I'm showing you here. So his, uh, the obituary mentions his humility, notably, and also his affection um, for the brothers. The obituary also tells us that he left an apparatum with images of the Annunciation to the Priory Rodnica. Now, apparatum uh, is a vague word in general, but in this necrology, it does seem to specifically mean a vestment set. So a chasuble with an Italian dalmatic and Alban and Trinitella and so on. Um, now this would probably be a lot like the Rokitsani chasuble that we have from the daughter house of Rodnice. I don't think this is the Rodnice example because Rokitsani, which was a became a Hussite town in the 15th century, would not be a place where you would send things um, for safekeeping. But it's very possible that Jenstein or somebody in his immediate inner circle donated the Rokitsani chasuble as part of a broader um, attempt to publicize the new feast of the visitation 
and that the now vanished Rodnitsi Chasbo is the one for which we have a written source. So the Rokitsani Chasbo, I think we can really understood as being very, very directly linked um, to Yenstein and his new feast. Less so, obviously, for Siena. Um, we know that this is an altarpiece of the visitation because it was an altar of the visitation. Both altar and altarpiece were founded by um, a cathedral canon, Francesco di Viaggio Tolome. Um, he endowed the visitation altar in 1422. And he himself had no known collections to Bohemia that I know of. I also haven't been able to say what liturgy was used for the visitation in the Duomo, unfortunately. Um, hopefully I'll be able to travel and figure that out, but I'll let you know. But there is a connection between Prague and Siena in the earlier generation in the person of Raymond and Capra. Raymond, who had been the confessor of St. Catherine of Siena before her death, became master general of the order of preachers and was sent to Prague as a papal legate um, in the 1380s. When he was in Prague, he met and apparently befriended Jenstein. He wrote a Magnificat treatise for him. And when three years later, Jenstein introduced the new feast, Raymond wrote a letter, a circular letter of congratulations, um, which was sent around sort of to, along with Jenstein's office, apparently, to a lot of dioceses throughout the Roman obedience. And he also wrote himself an office for the Dominican order. Um, because of this connection, it would seem the Dominican church of Siena, San Domenico, was apparently the first church in Italy to have an altarpiece whose main subject is the visitation. This isn't an altar of the visitation, it was for the Trinity altar, which is why the image of the Trinity at the top is bigger. But the central field shows the visitation, and this is an absolute innovation in Italy. Um, what's interesting is that this format, the format of using a Marian scene as the central uh, image of an otherwise unrelated altar, is the format of the patronal altars, like Simone Martini's. So this altarpiece in San Domenico is in a way arguing that the Feast of Visitation belongs in the same series of Marian feasts in the center of Sienese devotional life. This is an argument that bore fruit, as we know, um, but only some 20 years later. Um, I think this mostly has to do with different construction challenges in the Duomo, um, but it's very hard to reconstruct what the situation would have been in 1422 that would have allowed for this specific altarpiece. Um, I should point out that 1423 is also the year of the first post-Constance council, uh, which was called in Pavia and then moved to Siena. So the new altarpiece would have been uh, very prominent at the sort of first council of a reunited church after the end of the schism. So it could have had a sort of votive function, um, but that's a bit speculative. What I can say is that its iconography does seem to be very directly connected to the uh, propaganda for the new feast in a way that suggests that Jenstein's writings had more influence than we generally credit them with. Um, I do think it's important to note that this iconography was, could be derived from more common sources than from Jenstein's writings. It draws on Hugh of St. Victor, it draws on St. Bernard, it draws on sort of classic understandings of the Magnificat, um, but that attention would have been brought to those classic understandings by the propagation of a new Feast of the Visitation, a Feast of the Magnificat, and one that was supposed to have ecclesiastical significance. And I think just, just that blurb, that tiny sort of bit, could have generated for a theologically sophisticated clerical patron um, this sort of same imagery as you find in the Rokitsani Chasbo. So 